China has lifted more people out of poverty than any other country in history, about 700 million. That's remarkable, but still, that's not enough. China has set the national goal of becoming a moderately prosperous society by 2020, and a moderately prosperous society cannot have any people living below the poverty line, zero. As of March 2016, there was still 55.7 million people living below the poverty line. It's not only a matter of low income. Some people live under harsh conditions. Some cannot work, some are ill. One need not travel far from Beijing to find deep poverty. I drove some five hours to the mountains of neighboring Hebei province. I headed for Fuping County, where more than 40% of residents are under the poverty line. In 2012, President Xi Jinping came here as part of his focus on poverty. I visited the same village that he visited. I met the same family that he met to get closer to China. Fuping County in Hebei province is located in the remote Taihung Mountains, a five-hour drive from Beijing, while the rest of the country was rushing headlong to riches during nearly four decades of economic reform and rapid growth, life in Fuping remained largely unchanging. Prior to 2012, of Fuping's 230,000 residents, 108,000 were under the national poverty line. To see firsthand what poverty is, we've come to Zhang Jieying's family. Zhang Jieying is a sometime primary school teacher. Her husband, Yuan Jianzhong, used to be a freight truck driver. They live up in the mountains. A narrow mountain trail connects the family with the outside world. The family led a decent life until 2010, when her husband started coughing up blood at night. Zhang Jieying borrowed 100,000 yuan from her relatives so her husband could undergo the operation. After the operation, Yuan Zhejong had only his right lung and can no longer do any hard labor. Nonetheless, medical bills kept piling up. To make ends meet, Zhang Zhang's oldest daughter was forced to quit school and become a migrant worker. But her income did little to ease the family's economic plight. At the age of 15, Yuan Chanqing, Zhang's second daughter, began to face the harsh reality of life. <laughs> In Fuping, Zhang Jing is only one of the 108,000 people living in poverty. In China, Zhang Jing is only one of the 55 million people living in poverty. All struggle to cope with everyday life. The statistics of poverty draw attention to an often overlooked aspect of China's rise. While economic growth has been stunning over the past almost 40 years, it has also been uneven. In 2013, the Chinese government set the standard of precision in poverty alleviation as part of the national plan to lift all poor people out of poverty by 2020. Poverty elimination became a policy priority for China's 13th five-year plan from 2016 to 2020. Given the requirement for preciseness in poverty alleviation, 
Governments at all levels have established poverty relief measures for local conditions and encouraging innovation in methods. My guest features thought leaders in China's campaign to eliminate poverty. Lu Jing, governor of Fuping County, Hebei province. Su Gaosha, spokesperson of the State Council Leading Group Office of Poverty Alleviation and Development. And Agi Veras, country director of the United Nations Development Program in China. I've heard the term precision poverty reduction. What does that mean? Targeted poverty reduction is proposed in contrast to the undifferentiated approaches adopted before. It means more accuracy in defining beneficiaries, taking measures, establishing projects, and making use of finance. What's more, we need to designate the right people to offer help and guarantee the right effects. In this way, poverty reduction becomes more goal-oriented and more effective, and we should regard targeted poverty reduction as an important guiding principle. Have you seen a, a, a different approach, or at least from what you've studied in the past of what China has done and what China is doing today in terms of poverty reduction? It is actually a very different approach, because as you said before, just the economic growth and the industrialization itself naturally brings with itself uh, poverty reduction. But I think it was a bit more than that in China's case, because there was a conscious poverty reduction effort and strategy coupled with the whole industrialization concept. The approach today is, is very different because it has to be a targeted and contextualized approach. And at the same time, what it means that it has to focus on reducing inequalities and promote inclusiveness. Because the nature of poverty today, the rural poverty and, and the fact that these are pockets of poverty characterized by remoteness, lack of access to services and so forth, also means that they essentially reflect the inequalities in the country, the gaps of income level, the gaps of consumption level, and naturally because of that, the gaps of, of access to opportunities and services. How do you define poverty? What is the poverty line in Fuping County? The leading group office of poverty alleviation and development has developed the criteria to define the poor population. Since we aim to ensure that we all have adequate food and clothing, compulsory education, basic medical care and housing, we set up a quantitative scoring method based on the criteria. The 100 score consists of five indicators, that is, income, housing, education, medical care and social welfare, representing 50, 20, 10, 15, and 5 points, respectively. Take the example of this year, 2016. We need to watch for two thresholds when judging if a farming household should be classified as poor. The first threshold is about income. The national poverty line is 3,000 yuan annual income, and the country's poverty line stands at 3,500. If the household annual income is less than 3,500 yuan, the income indicator cannot score over 30. The second threshold is about the sum of the five indicators. If the sum is less than 60, the household is considered poor. If the sum reaches 60, yet the annual income stands below 3,500, the household still falls into the group of poor people. We go through the processes of collecting information, conducting all-round evaluation, approval, democratic review, and public consultation before making the judgment so as to ensure accurate poverty identification. How often are families evaluated? Once a year. At the end of every year, we conduct a re-evaluation of all households, especially the poor households. So that's a challenging task because you have so many families and everyone has to be analyzed on an individual basis, is that right? One of the responsibilities of the work teams is to gather accurate public information. They need to meet and interview the farming households in person and make sure both sides recognize the information. It's not the case that work teams simply fill out the forms alone, which is prohibited. The information collected needs to be recognized by the public. In addition to the self-evaluation done by the work teams in the villages, we also have third-party assessments. For instance, a third-party agency engaged by the leading group Office of Poverty Alleviation and Development has conducted an all-round evaluation of the population we helped to lift out of poverty. 
if we look at the poverty reduction in China, it's really been remarkable over the last uh, three plus decades, how many people, more than 600 million for sure, who've been lifted out of poverty. Um, as you look historically, but also more importantly now, what are the steps in bringing people out of poverty? Do you start by building a road or building a hospital, a school? Uh, what's the sequence of activities that is the best practice? I mean, first of all, you need to understand who are the poor people and where they are. And this is the first step because without that, it's very difficult to have some kind of targeted poverty approach. Historically, China had a larger number of poor people, which was of a gen more general nature than in today's um, environment. This meant that kind of general um, steps to be taken just by um, the improvement of the economy, industrialization, and general economic growth would naturally increase the living standards and the income levels of the population as a whole. Now, in today's world and in today's setting of the 55 million poor people still in China, this is a very different picture. Here we're talking about um, various reasons why these people are poor, both geographically and demographically very diverse. So in that sense, the steps need to be very different. So once we actually understood who these poor people are, where they are, and what makes them poor, that's when we can devise, and the Chinese government can also devise the next steps of how to address that poverty. What are current characteristics of China's impoverished population? The poverty-stricken population has some major disadvantages in common. First, they have few factors of production. Their per capita arable land area is lower than the national average, and they find it more difficult to get financial support such as loans. Labor deficiency is another problem. We created files of poor households nationwide and found that almost 20 percent of the households lack labor. So the first characteristic of the poor is a lack of production capability. The second characteristic is that a pretty low human capital quality. According to the files we sent up, 42 percent of the poor households have Sikh members and 92 percent of the labor force only have middle school education or below, which means that they have not attended high school. The government has rolled out nine-year compulsory education for about 30 years. It benefits the poor, but very few of them have access to high school education, which is a key constraint on their development. In addition, their living environments are harsher than others, since they live in a hardly accessible and disaster-prone regions of poor natural conditions, usually in the intersections of provinces. Without fair development conditions, they are vulnerable to external shocks. By regions, the poverty rate gets higher the further west it goes because of unfavorable natural conditions there. As we often put it, China's poor population live in former revolutionary bases, areas inhabited by ethnic groups, remote and border areas, and inhospitable regions. So it's more difficult to assist them than others. In early 2016, a nationwide survey revealed 55.7 million people living under the national poverty line. These poor people live largely in 832 counties across the country. To tackle poverty alleviation, central authorities recruited 320 departments covering all poverty-stricken counties. In addition to poverty relief funds, 1,266 officials from these departments were sent to the poor areas on poverty relief missions. Li Yan Lin is one of them. This is the second year of his three-year term in Gujatai village in Fuping County. He was an official from Hebei's capital. After he had been transferred here, he could only visit his family once a month. His job is to identify families under the poverty line, set up files for each family, develop ways and plans to help them, and keep track of their progress. <laughs> 
He takes us on a tour to see the progress Gujatai has so far achieved. With sufficient and steady funding, officials can institute long-term poverty relief measures, which always must be tailored to local requirements. Mushroom planting here has become a primary poverty reduction method, leveraging the region's temperature, particularly the cool nights. Gu Tingliang took out a loan of 50,000 yuan, about $7,500, and built his own mushroom hut. In addition to providing free lunch at school and helping the poor find income opportunities, the government is improving health care in both rural and urban areas. In Qinghai's rural areas, where health care is hard to access, the government employs part-time doctors. Every season, Bai Ma Dai Shi rotates with two of her colleagues to provide medical services for 703 villages in an area of 14 square kilometers. Like most doctors in China, Bai Ma is paid by government fiscal transfers. It is a multi-level structure that shares national tax revenues through allocations and transfers so as to ensure fair and balanced development throughout the country. What then are the measures that you're taking to achieve these specific results? And what are the metrics that you're using to determine if those results are indeed successful? To help the poor to increase incomes and get rid of poverty, we take four established measures. First, it's industrial poverty reduction. We help impoverished households to develop farming, cultivation, small-sized handicrafts, and family tourism to increase household income. Apart from technical services, we also provide micro-lending to the extent of 50,000 yuan to help families enhance production. The households can also access three-year loans of discounted interests and government-subsidized low-interest loans. The second measure is labor export. With rapid industrialization, many rural workers are moving to non-agriculture sectors. Children of poor households can enjoy free secondary vocational education and skills training with tuition fees covered by the government. After they graduate, we also help them to find job opportunities. We are frequently using the third measure of relocating impoverished households. For poor populations living in inhospitable areas or natural reserves, we help them relocate to human-friendly places or move to small cities and towns where they can find work. The fourth measure is providing the social net for those without labor capacity. We have set up a subsistence allowance system for rural areas nationwide. Now around 50 million impoverished people rely on the allowance offered by the government. So these are the four established measures and we are experimenting with new ones. For example, engaging the poor in ecological protection projects in protected areas where exploitation is prohibited by the government, such as national forest parks. Impoverished people are employed as forest workers. As Li Yanlin told us, mushroom planting has enabled many families to be already on the verge of lifting themselves out of poverty. But the challenge is to make sure that those who get out of poverty will not fall back again. As you know, China has uh, set uh, the goal of a moderately prosperous society by 2020 as one of its um, major goals, the first major goal of, uh, of uh, the entire Chinese reform. Um, and as part of that, it wants to and has set the goal to eliminate all poverty. Uh, so 55 million people to go uh, by the year 2020. So as you see that goal, which the government has set strongly, what are the uh, primary obstacles that you would see to achieving that? I think the reach and real understanding of the details of the poverty is, is one of the, the key issues. 
At the same time, the poverty reduction strategy of China is, is a quite a robust one. Um, they have devoted a lot of resources to map out the poverty. And once you know what the issues are and where they are, if the resources are available, you can address them. However, the, the main challenge is how sustainable are these measures? Are we just simply providing some basic living income to these people so that they, have, they are lifted above the poverty line? Or is the government and other actors providing solutions that will be sustainable and eventually transform the ways of life and transform the uh, economic social patterns that affect poverty? The poor population in poor counties will be taken out from the list when they reach average development levels. The poor population need to leave above the national poverty line and have adequate food and clothing, compulsory education, basic medical care and safe housing before being considered out of poverty. For poor counties, the poverty rate needs to drop below 2 percent for the central impoverished areas and 3 percent for western areas before they are considered out of poverty. The remaining poor population rely basically on Social Security as their fallback. We classify the population in the county into three groups, impoverished households, those that are basically out of poverty, and those that are no longer impoverished. In my view, households that are basically out of poverty still don't have a strong ability for self-development. They might return to poverty due to disasters or family trouble, so we pay close attention to this group in poverty reduction. To lift them completely out of poverty, we provide them with favorable policies to ensure they won't be dragged down again. Only in this way can we eradicate poverty. In 2013 alone, roughly 300 million yuan was allocated to support Fu Ping's poverty alleviation work, almost 1.5 times as much as the county had received over the previous two decades. The financial injections seemed to have worked. By 2015, per capita income had nearly doubled from the 2012 level. With government subsidies, Zhang Jiying's daughter was able to finish her nine-year compulsory education, and she'll be going to high school, having passed her entrance examination. With their daughter entering high school, Zhang Jiying's family will receive another 2,000 yuan special allowance. That may be just enough to pay for her daughter's tuition fee. But how to keep the poverty reduction funds flowing? That's another challenge that's haunting poverty alleviation officials. Obviously, the county itself can't afford these big uh, expenditures, whether it's uh, major infrastructure like roads or subsidizing so many people in their, in their lives. Uh, so when you need to get funding, say for infrastructure, how do you do that? Do you, how do you report to the... Uh, to, to, the, to the province or to the city, to the province. What, what is the process by which you apply for the funding that you need to get your people out of poverty? Financial support is a key challenge in poverty reduction since nothing can be done without money. To address the financial issue, we have adopted several approaches. First, striving for the support of the higher government. For example, when it comes to building roads, we have favorable policies on the national and provincial levels and we should seek government support. Second, we seek bank lending. Currently, there are considerable financial incentives for poverty reduction. By building an investment and financing platform for the county, we seek banks' financial support for the alleviation projects. Third, we pull together financial resources in the county. Our poverty reduction projects benefit from the land policies of the Ministry of Land and Resources. By making full use of the policies and land resources, we can pull and allocate resources for poverty reduction. Of course, we also get support from external agencies and officials. What specific programs would you do for them and how do they differ among each other? 
The counties are distributed in central and western part of China, which feature harsh natural conditions and weak development capacities. The government has introduced two types of policies to support the counties. The first is about general transfer payments. The counties make fiscal spending to cover salaries of public employees, such as teachers and doctors, and social security costs, such as subsistence allowances and health care costs. If their fiscal budget failed to cover the expenses, the government fills the gap with general transfer payments. The second type of support policies is special transfer payments. Special poverty reduction funds, including credit support, are earmarked for the counties. Third, the counties benefit from preferential policies by authorities of other sectors. Due to land scarcity, China has strict controls on land use. Last week, the Ministry of Land and Resources convened a meeting and decided that each of the 832 counties could use 600 additional acres of land, which would would generate huge revenues for them. In terms of transport construction, the 832 counties receive 700,000 fiscal subsidies for each kilometer of village road built, much higher than the 300,000 for their counterparts. This is also an example of the special transfer payments. Furthermore, the government provides free lunches for children in the 832 counties. We call it Better Nutrition Initiative. The free lunches alleviate financial burdens and encourages families to send their children to school. There are various preferential policies and what I mentioned are implemented every year and financed by the annual central government fiscal budget. How do you assure that the money that's being allocated from the central government according to your plan is actually being used for the purposes in which it was intended? We conduct supervision through several means. The most important one is auditing. The Poverty Reduction Fund is audited every year to ensure it is used in the scope of the policy documents. The second one is inspection. The leading group office of poverty alleviation and development and the Ministry of Supervision will inspect the use of the Special Poverty Reduction Fund and prevent professional crimes on an annual basis for the next five years. The two approaches are government-led. Outside the government system, we have just launched a third-party evaluation performed by the Institute of Geographic Sciences and Natural Resources Research, or CAS. Twenty academicians, 200 professors and 600 researchers are mobilized to make a sizable third-party evaluation, especially about the use of poverty reduction funds. It is an independent research that does not use government channels. The researchers visit households in person, and one thousandth of the poor population is covered. I think the evaluation study will help us to reveal problems and ensure all funds are used for the poor. If Chinese citizens live in poverty, China cannot be a moderately prosperous society. That's why the government has instituted its precision program to eliminate poverty, tracking every poor family and prescribing specific measures for each. For those who can work, it means earning a self-sustaining living. For those who cannot, it means receiving payments and services. Eliminating poverty also requires communal development, especially better housing, health care, and education. If you don't have a flush toilet, you are still poor. I was impressed by Li Yan Lin, the director of the Construction Education and Training Center of the Hebei Provincial Government who is spending two years, not two weeks, two years, as head of the Poverty Reduction Office in Guja Tai Village. I marvel that every poor family has its own file and was listed prominently on the office wall with their incomes and the specific plan to bring them above the poverty line. One test of China's success will be how many of the poor will become self-sustaining. The more who sell mushrooms and apples, the better. Will China eliminate poverty completely by 2020? Year by year, we watch the countdown to stay closer to China.